Welcome to Midlife Matters. I'm Marie, and each week I'm joined by my friends Julie and Mindy to talk about all the topics keeping women in the middle years up at night. Today we're talking about friendship. So many midlife women say they're lonely, and the past two years have been especially hard. Join us as we share when and why we've been lonely, what we've done about it, and where we hope to see our friendships in the future. Let's get started. Listeners, today we're talking about friendship. When we asked for topic ideas earlier this year, we had several requests for episodes about friendship. And we actually have done a couple friendship episodes. Julie and Mindy, do you remember episodes 44 and 130? One was about changes to friendship in midlife, and one was with Laura Tremaine, which was, I think, Mm. just basically how to make friends. (laughs) It kind of was like that. Yeah, yeah, that was really good. Yes, they were both very helpful in their own ways. But honestly, friendship between women can be complicated and new issues seem to pop up in midlife. And so some of the things we heard were, and let me just quote from the people, (laughs) they said, can you talk about managing adult friendships? And they specifically said what to do about mean adult girls, which you think you would have outgrown Mm -hmm. by now. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Changing friendship with women as your kids grow older. What to do when you're in a place where there aren't many women your age. Friendship with your adult children. Um, someone else asked to do asked us to do friends at this age, making new ones, keeping the old. We even had a listener send in an article called Moms in Midlife. Rarely alone, often online, and increasingly lonely. Is that not a depressing title, you guys? <laughs> But oh, it's yeah. so perfect. I mean, yes, <laughs> it was the perfect title. Each one of these could be delved into so much deeper. So today we're not going to be able to, you know, discuss all the things that people requested, but we're going to take on some of them. And the ones we don't get to, we can come back and do in a future episode because I know that even at almost 50 years old, I don't have friendship totally figured out. Julie and Mindy, are you guys experts yet? Well, just when you think you have it figured out, it changes. So really, you know, it's an evolving thing. Right. And I think it goes into the category of anything that you get used to is going to change. And friendship is also one of those things. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have to be constant learners. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go back to that article because we did want to highlight a few of the things that they said in that. So remember, the title was Moms in Midlife, Rarely Alone, Often Online, and Increasingly Lonely. And this was just published in the Wall Street Journal on January 22nd of this year. So it's very current. The first lines of it start off, middle age is a crowded time. It's also a lonely one. Work and family demands leave little time for nurturing friendships, particularly for women. So it really starts out hitting what a lot of us feel like maybe we're lonely, but we're also super busy and crowded. Do you guys find this to be true? Yes, it is. It is crowded. And I was thinking about, well, you know, as we're pinpointing this particular subject in our lives, how often in the day do we actually prioritize friendship? Because if we notice that it's missing, it's never on my to-do list, you know, or maybe it wasn't in the past, but it is now. And so I think that in life, friendship is maybe one of the lowest priorities that we each have. It's one of the the last relationships that we are intentional about building because everything else in your life and every family member comes first. Mm, And mm -hmm. so to me, I'm like, well, yeah, it takes a hit because it's the first thing that, oh, I don't have time, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And especially as your kids are getting older and you see the time with them shortening, then I think people do, well, women in particular, we do less and less outside the home. Like Mindy, you've talked about like, you don't want to lead a Bible study in the evening. You don't want to do something on the weekend. Um, You know, we want to be available. Whereas when my kids were little, it was like, oh, mom's night out, like bunko on Monday nights. Sure, I will definitely be there because I've got a million more of these exact same nights to repeat over and over again. Mm, (laughs) At least that's how you feel in your mind. And you don't feel like that as much when you get to teenagers. And I was a little slow to answer this question because I think I'm in a different place even than you two, uh, not having kids at home and just, I feel like everyone else is busy. Mm. And Mm -hmm. 
like, oh, you know, like I, I'm hesitant to call it. Oh, they, they probably have a lot going on or whatever. And I'm kind of in that in-between stage, having friends that still have teenagers and still have kids at home. It makes me uh, hesitant to to call or ask to do things because I think, oh, they're too busy. Right. Mm. Like you don't want to mm-hmm. be perceived because I I have a little more time right now, but I don't want to be perceived as too needy, you know, mm-hmm. or. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, that's yeah. a whole nother story. It's like, where's the fine line here? You know? Right. So what are we like five minutes into this episode? And listeners, you can tell we have some like thoughts and feelings around friendship. Who knows? <laughs> but hopefully some of you guys can relate. One of the things the article went into was about the role of social media and kind of, you know, this generation, our generation of midlife women is probably the first generation that can sort of fill some of those friendship holes with social media. Like I know my own mom wasn't able to fill friendship holes with social media. So like I'm the next generation after her. And so I can kind of do that. But the article said, for women feeling burned out from holding family life and work together, social media has typically been the most convenient place to vent and seek connection. But going online has surfaced feelings of inadequacy and loneliness, many say. One of the women in the article wrote that social media, particularly her Facebook page, it's a link to people you haven't talked to in ages. I can see their lives, but I'm not a part of them. Social media has made me feel less isolated, but more lonely. Have you guys felt that way? Like using social media, like we try to fill that hole, but I don't necessarily know that it can do the job. Yeah, I I think that... um... Social media is great for inspiration, finding out information, even reading wise counsel, but it's just still not a great substitute for in-person interaction, at least for me. Mm -hmm. So for my real in-person friendships, I'd rather hear from you. I'd rather take a walk with you, meet you for coffee versus just looking at your feed, hitting the like button and feeling like I've done my (laughs) duty, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) like, because that can easily satisfy me. Like, well, I've I've done that for them, you know, and then it it doesn't lead to continuing that friendship in in person, you know, and so I, I find social media, I'm using it for to stay connected with people that I don't really know in person. And that way you can't be disappointed. Like mm. you can't you can't say, well, they had a party without me because these people live in another state or another country, even, you know, mm-hmm. like no fear of being left out, no expectations. I like that part of it. So, yeah, I, I just think social media is it's good and it's bad. I have a love hate relationship mm-hmm. with it. You know, it's not a place for honesty. Like, it's just not. It's not mm-hmm. even designed to be that way. You know, like nobody wants to share that and nobody really wants to read that, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's OK. And I, I think, you know, we all say, well, we understand that. Right. No matter how self-aware we are, we still struggle with not being able to deal with the the dishonesty of social media, you know, like we all say, if I just had her, her stuff, her house, her view, her family, then I'd have a more meaningful life. I think that's just a temptation that we all fall into no matter how much we know that's not true. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's my, that's my dislove of social media. (laughs) Yes. Well, it's such a unique space in that if you look at your friend list, um, it really is I'll say the majority, it's a link to the past. And if you're living in the past with people, you know, you have, even if you haven't moved places, if you have lived the same place your whole life because of your life circumstances or where your kids went to school or you used to go to that church, well, you are constantly changing as a person. And so you have to constantly think about, I should be adding new friends to my social media accounts, because Mm -hmm. you're always meeting new people always. Mm -hmm. All right. If you move, of course, you're going to meet new people. But if you stay the same place, you're still meeting new people because your kids will go to another school. You'll try a class at the gym. You'll get into a, a group of women in a Bible study at church. I mean, so I think that you have to be so intentional about not living for those past times and Mm -hmm. even past people, you know, it's nice to stay connected with them, but to realize that you should always be moving forward. And so 
not everyone will always move forward with you. And that's okay. We talked about that in our other episodes. Mm -hmm. And then I love that Julie said this in one of the other podcasts that we did on friendship, that she's very intentional then about trying to meet those people in in person, like you just said, but it should definitely um, come. It should be something that's happening in real life. And so it's easy to get melancholy looking on social media. Well, I like what she said. If you're just looking at their life, but you're not a part of it, is that Mm -hmm. really, not that that's bad, but I'm saying that's not really helping your feelings of yeah. connectedness you know it's not it's that not. contributes to our feelings of loneliness because yeah. uh one of the women said some days i feel like i'm a teenager again wondering why can't i find a group like that to fit into am i not funny enough am i too introverted like everybody has a friend group online it can almost exacerbate our loneliness mm-hmm. it does and when i feel that way i know that i need to get off because Even, you know, there's people that I have known and loved for a long time, but you end up gravitating towards some of the same people on social media, or you get used to talking, you know, or, you know, commenting on somebody's feed or whatever. The same goes for family or friends um, that, you know, and it's like, you can feel, you can feel discarded or unloved or, you Mm -hmm. know, you're missing out and it's, it can be very hurtful. Mm -hmm. So that's when. It's nice to turn that off, maybe. (laughs) Right, right. And another thing the article talked about, because it was specific to how COVID has increased the loneliness of midlife women. And we can talk about this a little bit more. But I do think that in the last two years, I mean, by the time this episode is released, it probably will have been two years, our friendships, some of them have completely transformed. Some of them aren't there anymore. Like COVID has really hit people hard in the friendship area. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's a lot to do with that as far as loneliness too. But why don't we just start out with, you know, and I think we've kind of alluded to this, but when do you guys, we've alluded to the fact that we do feel lonely at times, but more specifically, when do you guys feel lonely? Like when, is there like times that you know you're going to feel lonely? Is there times that are reoccurring loneliness? Or is there a time where you were even more lonely than usual in your midlife? Yeah, I, I thought of several times where I tend to feel lonely. And and I'll let Mindy talk about this one more. But I felt lonely when I first moved to Nashville. Uh, I remember wanting that instant community. And I was kind of jealous of those that already had it, like that they had long-term relationships. And I just remember how good it felt to finally, you know, to go into the grocery store and somebody recognized me and called out my name. It was like, ah, oh, you know, I heard my name in the grocery store. Yes. I, felt, I felt a part of things. Um, I know it can be really lonely, like when you've drifted apart from a friend, maybe like they've moved on and you haven't and that you don't know why. And that feels weird. And, and like you said, Mindy, sometimes that's just normal, you know, and most recently, I would say I felt lonely because I don't know too many people that are going through what I'm going through right now. And that really makes you feel all alone. And no matter how many people are in the room or around you, and because I don't ever want to hurt my friend's feelings like I feel alone. It's not like you're not doing enough. It's just there. Like, I, I think we find solidarity more in our struggles with other people than we do in times of ease. Like, mm. It's easy to celebrate the, your joys in your life with just about anybody, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, but pain has a way of making you just feel more alone. And, and in my case, my husband having cancer, um, but, you know, it could be the pain of a wayward child, a struggling child, a, an illness, a difficult marriage, depression. There's lots of things that can make you feel isolated in midlife. Mm-hmm. So I think just finding those people that have that similar struggle is just, there's a lot of solidarity in that. And, but sometimes that's hard to find. Mm -hmm. Right. It made me think that I, I know that that's why there are support groups made, Mm -hmm. you know, you hear about support groups for everything. It's because those people in those groups haven't found in their everyday circles of people, what they need in that season. True. But, um, but yes, when thinking about feeling lonely moving, of course, was the first thing on my list. 
But then, you know, the caveat of that is it almost makes it easier because you know it's going to happen. Like you know you're going to be alone. You can plan for being alone. And then you are very intentional. Like I have been extremely intentional about building relationships since I have moved to LaGrange because I'm new. And then people hear you're new. So they're like, oh, welcome, you know, and then you can kind of see who has room in in their schedule. Um, It is still lonely, you know, when I see all of my new friends and they have 20 years of memories together, 40 Mm -hmm. years of memories together. Mm -hmm. And, And that makes me feel lonely. But at the same time, I'm thankful for where I have been. So no, I'm not going to be a part of everything. That's that's not ever going to happen. But just as Julie said, um, not not only moving, but anytime your life changes, when your role changes, your kids, you know, change schools, you can feel lonely. You're not seeing those same people anymore um, when they leave the house. Um, you know, you're in a different stage of life. So when your life stage changes, your role changes. When there's an outside change that affects your availability, you could have an aging parent that now you have to take to the doctor all the time, whereas you used to be able to meet your friends for lunch or you're watching your grandchildren and you used to be able to do things. And so I just, there's so many hits, you know, to that friendship role. Again, I just see it as like, it's the last thing on the priority (laughs) list. So Mm -hmm. it goes first. Yeah. And you know, Mindy, it's socially acceptable to be lonely when you move. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have to have any feelings of shame around being lonely if you've just moved. It's like, well, of course you're lonely. I don't have any friends. (laughs) Right. Like it's not because of anything I've done or because I don't even have a track record here. It's just because I'm new. Um, That's right. I think that when we go through some of those other transitions, like if we change life stages or, um, you know, our kids move schools or if there's some other reason, maybe we've left a church, like if there's some other reason that your friendships aren't the same, there can be an element of shame around it. Like, how can I be this old and feel lonely? Right. <laughs> Do right. you guys know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes. 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 Because you want to count your friends as you get older. And there are those times you're like, do I have any close friends? You know, and you're like, how am I whatever age you are? Right. And I <laughs> <laughs> and I've got like three people that I feel like maybe I can call or I don't feel like I can call anybody about this. Yeah, I think that that's a real um either fear that people have that that's going to happen to them, or if it has been happening, then there's like a real shame around that. So if you're listening and you're like, yeah, I've lived in the same place my whole life, but I'm kind of feeling lonely. We've gotten messages from people like that, that feel so alone and they haven't moved. Um, It's just life circumstances have brought them to a place where they feel really lonely. And you know, the couple people that they used to really count on aren't there for them anymore. And, you know, this is something that happens over and over again in your life. And I think when you're young, you think, oh, well, once I get some established adult friendships, then I'll finally be done having to make friends, (laughs) sort of, you know, unless I move. (laughs) But you're never done. (laughs) Right, right. You're never done with these feelings. Um, I know even my own mom has said, like, you think that, um, and this is, you know, not really the mean girl things, but sort of the mean girl things. Like, you think that in the 70s and 80s, there's just going to come a time where people are all welcoming and it's going to be so easy to make friends. And it's like they're in high school again. Like, it never changes. (laughs) You can spot those people, though. Like, um, it has been evident to me when I meet somebody new. If they are really not interested, I mean, Mm. just like Mm -hmm. I've got my friends, I'm good. I Mm -hmm. don't, I don't need you or maybe I don't like you. And that's hard. It's hurtful. Mm -hmm. And it's just like you change your focus. Just don't look at them. Like you're not going to get what you need from that person. Move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I was talking with Julie last week about what should we do about the mean girl question? Have you ever experienced Mm. the girls? I have experienced the mean girls 
And, you know, I think sometimes we're surprised that sometimes that still happens as adults. But there are, Mm -hmm. Mindy, people that are just not interested Mm -mm. in people outside their group. They are not welcoming. They do Mm -hmm. not care to add to their friendship circle. And you're just going to have to get through whatever interaction you're forced to have with them. And maybe (laughs) don't take it personally. You know, I don't know. Yeah. When we were talking about this, Maria, I told you this story. I'm, I'm I'm in this little online community of home decor people, you know, it's, it's, it's just a fun escape and that's, that's all there is. It's just home decor and it's just a nice little online community. And apparently on certain days, they'll ask people to share people's new accounts. Like, Hey, I've, I've discovered this account and they share it in their stories so that you can kind of get discovered. One lady kind of wrote this post that was really telling. I thought of what we're talking about here today. She said, oh, I just hate to do this because she said, I feel like people will go back to the days at elementary school when they're getting picked for the dodgeball team. Like, mm. if I don't share you, you did. it's like you didn't get picked for the team or you were the last one picked. And she said, I just, she goes, I know that's not the intention, but I just hate to go there on this account. And I thought that was so... Um, what's the word? Like astute? <laughs> uh, yes, that she could see that in, mm-hmm. in something so subtle that was meant to be so good, you know, like I'm going to promote these people. But she realized to promote someone, you have to not promote someone else, you yeah. know. And um, I remember one of my accounts got shared that week and I was so excited. But it was I was also like, oh, is anybody going to share me? Is anybody going to, yeah, you mm-hmm. know, like it was weird. It's like I'm 56. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and you can still have those feelings of when you were a kid, you know, mm-hmm. and how that felt. Right. So obviously it's just a human emotion mm-hmm. and instinct your whole life. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. The yeah. issue of competitiveness. Um, Mm -hmm. in all different forms is a constant variable in friendships. The publication of your own self um, or how selfish a person is really weighs into how good of a friend they are as well. Um, Mm -hmm. Those are two very also other topics, but that they weigh into this being competitive, being selfish, all the ugly parts of it, I guess. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about COVID because this article kind of dove into that. And I think one of the reasons we probably got a lot of requests at the end of the year last year for episodes on friendship was because this past two years has been so hard on people's friendship. How did COVID contribute to loneliness for you? It was completely awful for me. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) 100% awful because we lived we had just moved to a part of the country and place that we had never been. We had still had not found a good church home, which always has become our family. Um, People's fear of getting sick far outweighed their fear of missing out, which then made them act, you know, scared of you or, you know, they would separate themselves from you and and I personally was separated from because my husband was working at a hospital. People didn't know what we were dealing with. And so um we were very much isolated in a place that we had been trying to make home. And so friendships that had begun to build completely went flat. I had one friend that we did try to, you know, FaceTime and walk together and we used to walk together in person, but even when we moved, I couldn't hug her to leave and mm. it broke my heart. And mm-hmm. we're friends. She's a good friend. Mm-hmm. But I think the fear of the sickness far outweighed fear of not having friends. And it just hurt so mm-hmm. much. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought about you a lot thinking that, you know, it's so hard for you to move. Yeah. But to compound that with not even being mm-hmm. able to work on friendships. Mm-hmm. Um, must have been really, really hard. It was very hard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, one of the things you said was people didn't want to spend time with you because your husband worked in a hospital. That was one of the, the hardest things. Like I just stopped not liking people, but it made me 
angry when people made me or other people feel less than because they thought you might be at more risk of spreading the disease. And that mm-hmm. was just like you said, the the fear of sickness far out wi- outweighed even human kindness and compassion in certain mm-hmm. situations. Like there, there was hurt. There was hurt. And I told the funny, funny in air quotes story of the lady running away from me at Target. I could have cried. I mm-hmm. mean, mm-hmm. it, it felt so awful. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I knew this was going to be a deep talk topic, but I think there are other listeners that have felt this way. It mm-hmm. is, it was so hurtful. It was so isolating. And so we have many more wonderful things to share, but I think that needs to be spoken because um, it has changed how I relate with people now, having gone through that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think for COVID, like, what you said about friendships falling flat. I hadn't just moved to a new area, but I think what COVID did was if someone then never cared, and I don't mean cared, but like if you never even saw that person for another six months and you didn't care to keep in touch or touch in or check in, what did that really say about your relationship? So it was kind of like at the end when people did start to emerge a little bit, it was like, I don't know. If all this time went by and you didn't care enough to get together, probably really wasn't that much there. I think it was a very telling situation on a lot of people's friendships. Um, I don't know. Does that sound bad? I think there's probably other people that felt (laughs) that way. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's like when, when you take away your natural times to see these people and get together, it is hard to, that's a lot to maintain, you know, when you're not getting to see them in person and I don't know. Yeah. Cause I know there are people that were more on the somewhere between acquaintance and friend mm-hmm. that those are the people that kind of dropped off. But I hope that after, you know, I think we're done with COVID <laughs> as we're coming out. I hope those are friendships that can pick back up. And that's something that uh, Laura Tremaine said in her podcast or interview that we did with her on friendship was just call an old friend that you've maybe grown apart from, or they've dropped off like, and don't feel like you need to apologize and tell them where you were. Like, just call them and say, I've missed you. Can we get together? And and I've remembered that advice. I thought that was really, really good that you don't, you don't owe them a big explanation necessarily. (laughs) They probably have the same reasons that you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think too, that, um, that COVID kind of gave permission for me and and a lot of people to be more withdrawn and apathetic. And it's like, and now it's kind of like face to face is just too hard. Um, And it's just kind of hard to come back out. And I thought about, um, you know, like they say people that have been in the hospital laying in a bed flat on their back for every day that they've done that, it takes two days to recover. Mm. And I think, Maybe four that's kind years of, then before people start interacting <laughs> normally. Well, I know it's kind of wow. abnormal here. Like it's going to be a slow thing. Like I never dreamed that we'd be in this two years, and so I think it. You know, it, it just may take a while, and I hope that people will not be satisfied with doing things virtually. I hope that that people, you know, that if things can be done in person, that they will. I know some of those things like working at home, a lot of people enjoy and that may stay, but I hope most things people get tired of all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think COVID just brought people face to face with their relationships, you know, and really made people get honest where things that they may have brushed off or ignored because of busyness. I think just a lot of people like you said, Julie, I mean, you felt permission to be more withdrawn. Um, You know, you could withdraw from those relationships that you didn't really care to keep up. It really exposed people, people's friendships where you weren't going to stop seeing each other. If there was a will, there was a way. So like if you had to meet outside with a heater and wear 50 Mm -hmm. layers, you were still going to do it because that relationship was important and you weren't just going to wait for permission to say, hey, let's get together again. Like, 
I think it did expose a lot of that kind of thing. And I think when people take stock after two years, I just don't know how you can not have seen some changes in the way you view friendship and the way friendship acts. I don't know. I feel like you'd be hard pressed to find someone that said, no, COVID didn't do anything to my friendships. (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. I I read somewhere that said, I think some friendships were pruned during COVID. And I thought, well, that's, that's probably a good term, you know, Mm -hmm. like, Mm-hmm. Uh, some things maybe need to be cut back and then see if they grow back and, mm-hmm. you know, or um, focus on on some people that you really are close to. And I don't know. I just feel like we have a capacity for how much we can <laughs> mm-hmm. keep going. I know I do um, right. that I can't have a ton of friends. You know what I mean? I just I'm not capable of doing that. And so a lot of my friendships, I think, depended on running into them or mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. so, so they did kind of fall away when I didn't have that mm-hmm. uh, natural encounter. Mm-hmm. As, so. as much as like life stage and role and availability affects friendships, we added one more monster to the mix of how do you <laughs> feel about vaccinations? How do you feel about masks? Because mm-hmm. these people we've been friends with forever if you're getting together, no two people felt the same way about Mm -hmm. what was socially acceptable. And we've had so many different phases of this, um, pandemic Mm -hmm. that, um, no two people felt the same way at the same time. And it was just one more monster that would separate people, you know, and we'd said like, this is not a socially acceptable conversation, you know, because it just has divided so many people. So it, I'm thankful. I agree, Julie. COVID seems to be on its way out. And I do hope that this conversation today will help give us a skill set if you have not started getting back out there to um, really be intentional and careful with these precious things that we call friends. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the nice things about COVID was you did have permission to not be as busy. And so now we don't have that excuse a lot of times. And so now we can find ourselves back in that like rat race again. But are the relationships really any deeper? Like, I don't know. I mean, it's good to remember that just because you're seeing someone and having casual conversation, is that really your friend? I don't know. Because would you seek each other out if you weren't just running into each other? Yeah, right. And that's a change that I have seen. I know we'll delve into more in a bit, but having moved during COVID, I know there's a lot of people that had to do that. I have met a lot of hungry people. They are ready for friendships. They are done being alone. Mm -hmm. They are prioritizing friendship in a way that I have not seen before. And so it has allowed us to begin thriving a lot quicker, actually, here in LaGrange than Mm -hmm. some other you know, moving situations that we have had in the past. So Mm -hmm. I do see some really positive things coming out of this um, pandemic. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know, here in Nashville in particular, if you're coming out of your bubble and willing to get together with people again, I think you're going to find out that a ton of people have moved here. And you are going to meet new people (laughs) left and right. And they need friends, you know? I mean, someone this weekend just told me that they moved here during the pandemic and they've kind of gotten their kids established, but they looked at their husband recently and like, we don't have any friends. Like, it's been hard for them to make friends. Like, there are people out there that are really open to friendship Mm -hmm. in a way that you may not have seen before this pandemic because they didn't even live in your neighborhood. (laughs) So (laughs) that's one thing that kind of leads into the question, like, how much room in your life do you have for new friends? Maybe we're sitting here talking about loneliness and how we've been lonely, but how much room in our life do we make for new people? It is an intentional part of my everyday life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) For you to make room for new people, Mindy? For me. Mm-hmm. I am already known in workout classes as the greeter. Mm. If anyone new walks in, the teacher knows I'm going to make her feel welcome. Mm-hmm. And um, I very much have eyes to see somebody that 
is new Mm -hmm. or um, looking for a friend. And tell us, like, how do you make room? Like, what does that look like? Like, would you invite them somewhere? Do you like, what do you do to make room for new friends? Well, not everybody you meet is going to be in your social circle. But I think the, the, if you can see yourself as a liaison, first of all, to be welcoming and kind, but when you meet someone, it might make you think of somebody else that you have met in their same life stage. Mm. So helping be a connection to somebody else, because you're not going to necessarily be everybody's friend, but if you can tell that they are looking and open, then you can also try to, you know, think of somebody else that has some something in common and introduce them and let them take it from there. So mm-hmm. whether you become their friend and intentionally say, hey, well, let's get coffee um, or lunch, go for a walk or, hey, I want to introduce you to so and so. Julie, do you feel like you've made room for new friends in your life? I mean, I, I do say that I have room for new friends, but um, right now this is a really hard time because I don't, I don't know, like that's, that's kind of mm-hmm. down on my list right now. <laughs> sure, sure. And it's sad because like, I of course want new friends and I want friends, but that's, it's just so hard to put time and energy into friends right now with what's going on here at home and and I know friendships don't just happen. And mm-hmm. I think that is part of the problem. I mean, if we're all lonely, I think we're all tempted to just wait on other people to initiate, make the plans, make the call. Mm. And I'm I'm talking to myself here. Mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. But there must be some of that if we're all saying we're lonely, you know, mm-hmm. like who's making the first call. So Mindy, when you were telling me about you being known as the greeter, I just thought of this quote I heard this week. And it was that every baby is born looking for someone looking for her. Mm. And I Mm -hmm. thought, you know, that never ends. Like we're Mm -hmm. always looking for somebody that's looking for us. Mm -hmm. So that's great, Mindy, that, you know, people know that you're looking out, you're looking for them. If they're not there, you're going to ask them, well, Mm -hmm. what's going on? You know, what, um, Mm -hmm. And Marie, you're good about that too. Like if I say, no, I can't do something like, well, is everything okay? Are you not just to blow it off, but dig a little deeper? Mm -hmm. I think one of the first things people do when they are feeling lonely and it's counterproductive and counterintuitive is you withdraw. And wait, Julie, like you said, I mean, that's Mm -hmm. our first instinct is to withdraw and wait for someone to reach out. People may not even notice that you've withdrawn for months. It could be years before they even notice that you've withdrawn. So if you're a listener out there waiting, it may not even be that people are aware that you're lonely yet. I don't know how we can get past that. Yeah, and it's not even intentional. I mean, some of it's just you literally don't have the energy to show up places. <laughs> right. Um, I think it's just really tempting to try to do life alone because friendships are, are hard. They're risky, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that's like right now, I just don't know that I have the energy to take a risk or to right do something that hard. Like it's a struggle. It's a, mm-hmm. you know, and on the other hand, I know God created us to be needy, but it's hard to need. It's like, mm-hmm. what if people can't handle me right now. Like I am way too much, <laughs> mm. you know, like this yes. is, this is just too big. This is too much. Mm-hmm. It is such a telling statement, Julie. And it just resonates so loudly. Like everyone has felt that way. If they don't know, they have felt it or will feel it. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I'm too much for people right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, one of the questions was, how do you make new friends and keep your old? Do you guys have any advice on that. Um, I feel like one of the things I do is just invite new people to something I'm already doing. Yes. And that way you can see your old friends and introduce them to your new friend and hopefully they hit Mm -hmm. it off. And like, you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. I don't know. That is so perfect and such Mm -hmm. a beautiful answer. I'm not even going to add to it. (laughs) It is so, 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 so good. That is great. It can be hard though. Like, One, Mm -hmm. it can be hard as the new person going into an established group. So if you're invited somewhere by someone 
And you're like, oh, but they've been getting together for 10 years. This is going to be really awkward. You know, nobody can fix that awkwardness for you. You're probably just going to have to walk through it. But hey, the invitation was extended. How many invitations can we afford to turn down, people? (laughs) If someone (laughs) invites you somewhere. Perspective, baby. Yeah. And then (laughs) as the person that's been going to the group, you're also taking a chance because all the other people might be like, well, why'd she invite her? She coming every time now? What's her deal? Like, and that goes back to kind of just how women are. But I still do think that's the best way to incorporate new and old friends. Yeah, definitely less risky than just inviting a new friend to coffee, you know, because it's just you and her like, oh, gosh, this might not go well. But Mm -hmm. at a party or another gathering, it's a little feels a little safer. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've talked about a lot of we've touched on a lot of parts of this today. You know, there's just no way in 45 to 55 minutes we can solve all the midlife women's problems on friendship, but (laughs) at least we can make people feel heard and not alone. So what advice would you have for someone who's feeling lonely? Like if they listen to this episode hoping to get some kind of nugget to take into their real life, what would you say to someone who's feeling lonely? Well, like I said earlier, if we're all feeling lonely, that maybe part of the problem is that we're waiting for connection and friendship to find us. And we might might need to do the real work of having real conversations and be, you know, deeper connected living, showing up, uh, being more vulnerable, you know, being willing to share what's going on. And I know like over the years, I know I've said this to you, Marie, (laughs) over and over, like the pendulum can swing from, well, friendships are just the best to does anybody even know I'm alive? (laughs) You know, like (laughs) I can just swing from, from back to forth, back and forth. So I, and I know that when I'm in that, does anybody even know I'm alive phase? I'm sure those people are asking the very same thing, Mm -hmm. you know, like we're all asking that. So just to not feel like you're you're the only one that Mm -hmm. other people are asking this question. I know they are because I've talked to them. Mm -hmm. Um, Just, uh, I was, I'm in a Bible study and right now we're studying first Samuel. And last week we looked at the friendship between Jonathan and David and the leader said something that was so profound. She said, there's no such thing as a good friendship that's low maintenance. And I thought, gosh, that's, Mm -hmm. (laughs) there are low maintenance people. Yes. Mm -hmm. But the Mm -hmm. friendship, can't be low maintenance. And she said, real friendship isn't requiring that we lay down our life for our friends. It's laying aside our life. It's being inconvenienced. Mm. And I thought, Mm -hmm. wow, that's really, (laughs) that's really Mm -hmm. powerful. That's good. That's good advice. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's exactly where I was going to go with this. Um, What you sow, you will reap. If you can build up friendships in the seasons of plenty, so that those friends, you can at least save a few in the seasons of famine. Because mm-hmm. we all go through seasons of plenty and seasons of famine. You have to sow those things in the seasons of plenty. That's so Also, true. keep looking. If you haven't found your people, they are there. I promise. You will find one person, at least. I have prayed many times for my kids and also for myself. Lord, show me one new friend for my Mm -hmm. son. Please Mm -hmm. give him someone. But also, I would encourage you, highly encourage you, to work on your friendship skills. This is a skill set that I feel like I can say that I do it better having moved so much because I've had to practice meeting people, making friends, trying to keep friends, trying to get past shallow conversations. It is an actual skill set that can be practiced and can you can get better at it. And it really boils down to asking questions and then listening to the answers, which we have a podcast about that, about listening, and then remembering. Hmm. remembering the things that you have learned about that one person and it will give you some place to, to begin building something from. Mm -hmm. So working on the skill of being a friend. You are a pro Mindy. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I have learned some of these skill sets because as you heard earlier, I have definitely been in seasons of famine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if someone's lonely out there, I think I just want to say, like, 
rejection is a part of this process. And I think sometimes we reach out and we get like a no. And then we're like, well, I'm not trying anymore. But it might take you a few times to connect with someone, like maybe your schedules just don't jive, but maybe try. And I know that's hard. It's hard for me. And so it must be hard for other people to not think, well, they're probably just don't want to get together with me. And they're just saying that they're busy, you know, like, oh, well, this has happened three times. So I'm giving up. Yeah, like, it's almost like this, it's going to get worse before it gets better, maybe, (laughs) you know, and that that's normal, like you're going to maybe go through some rejection and maybe some friendships that fall flat, like you thought you might connect with this person, but you really don't like it's like a slog sometimes and you just have to put one foot in front of the other. And you do have those moments, Julie, where you're like, does anyone even know I'm alive? I give up. But the next day you have to get up and start again, because what is the alternative to live in loneliness? Yeah. Like that's not a viable <laughs> alternative either. Well, Marie, I remember you saying that in an earlier podcast, like when you text me and say, can you walk? And I say, no, I've, you know, I've got to go to the doctor today or whatever. You'll say, well, what about Friday at three? You know, like you have an, you have an alternative, not just going to leave it as, okay, you know, which, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're not thinking I'm rejecting you. And you're also saying, well, I, I, this is important to me. I do want to get together. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. And the only other advice I would give is there are people that are looking for you right now. And the conversations that I hear more often is I'm not hearing as much, oh, we should get together sometime. And it never happens. I'm actually hearing, when do you want to get together? Mm -hmm. What works for you? Like Mm -hmm. that tends to be the more common conversation as I meet people. Mm, so mm-hmm. someone is looking for you, mm-hmm. not in a creepy way, <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> well, listeners, we hope this was helpful for you. I mean, we are definitely not experts. We clearly have struggled with this. I know it just helps to even just talk with the two of you about friendship and to know that we're not alone. Like probably any feeling or thought you've had, someone else has had the same feeling or thought. So yep. you're probably not alone mm-hmm. or weird in what you're thinking or how you're feeling. We would love to hear from you. If you have any friendship advice, you can email us at midlifematterspodcast at gmail.com or come and find us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast. But before we go, we want to do I'm a fan. Mindy, what are you a fan of this week? Honestly, I'm a fan of our book, The Happy School. Because in my current friendships, it's actually been a relationship builder to be able to take it like from the podcast, but have more intentional conversations with these new friendships that I'm building Mm. and also with older friendships that Mm -hmm. I've come in contact with those people here and there. And so I don't know why, because I totally reject self-help fish kind of books, <laughs> but this particular book has actually really helped. Um, it's given me a basis with some friends, a conversation starter, I guess. And I've been able to get to know people a little bit better through having read it. Mm-hmm. Now you're promoting self-help books, Mindy. <laughs> what is wrong with me? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, and just as a little extra for people that are listening for advice on friendship, I think that discussing books And being in a book club is a great way to further your friendships because that is what you're talking about. Like you already have a built in thing to talk about and probably they have a thought on it and you have a thought on it. And that leads to some other conversation starter. And so if you could have a neutral thing like a book or something to talk about, it can really spark deeper conversations and takes away maybe the fear you have of asking a deep question because you can ask it like within the context of what you read. I mean, there's some deep questions you can ask your friends in the happy school book, Mindy. Yes, yes, it's very true. Yeah, great, great point, Marie. That is so true. Julie, what are you a fan of this week? I'm a fan of hot honey. Oh, (gasps) sounds good. Is he putting it on your body or eating it? Uh, No, Marie, (laughs) no. I don't even know what that's about. (laughs) I don't either, but it reminds me of like hot yoga or something. (laughs) Do not just say that. (laughs) That is so funny. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Back 
on track here. Um, <laughs> no. Um, well, this is even funnier. John got this gift as a Christmas present. <laughs> oh, from you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Mindy's fanning herself over here. <laughs> no. I'm crying. <laughs> okay, Julie. All jokes aside, John got okay. a gift for Christmas. Yes. It's called Mike's Hot Honey. It's infused with chilies. And the only time I ever use honey is in my tea. And um, this honey says, enjoy on pizza, fried chicken, cheese, tea, salad, ice cream, fruit, seafood, yogurt, ribs, oatmeal, and cocktails. Mm. So I had no idea that people eat I hot didn't... honey on a lot of savory foods. I know. I wouldn't have even thought about drinks. putting honey on pizza yeah. or in my drink or something. I mean, maybe tea, but yeah. Yeah, so I have tried it on pizza. It's delicious and uh, like not on pepperoni pizza, but it was really good on barbecue chicken pizza. Mm. And then I make a latte. And it's called a bee sting and it's got the hot honey in it. Oh, so that it's really, good. really good. And I looked it up because this was a gift. So I assumed it came from some specialty store, but they actually sell it at Publix and Target, oh. Walmart. Uh-huh. Uh, and you can get it on Amazon too. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good. I bet that would give somebody a real surprise if you, if you know, if you said like, "Hey, do you want honey in your tea?" and you put that in instead, you yeah, could really it's surprise spicy. your guests. It's pretty spicy. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's a friendship builder. Ask your friend, "Hey, you want some hot honey?" and just check their reaction. <laughs> you can see how risky they are. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm a fan of something kind of boring, but you know, sometimes life just needs these boring recommendations. So I hate bath towels, hand towels, washcloths that when you wash them, the ends shrink in. Have you guys ever had hmm. that? It's like that should stay an even rectangle. It shouldn't be like yes. one end goes in and then the other end like goes in. Like if it in. has that little band across yes. it. it gets, yeah. Yes. So I started buying these towels at Home Goods years ago, but now they also sell a quick dry version and it's Caro, C A R O towels. Have you ever seen that brand at Home Goods? Um, mm -hmm. If you're looking for towels, they carry quite a bit. And just as a comparison, I happened to buy, I was on, on my search for new towels. I happened to buy some Target towels. And then a couple of weeks later, I happened to buy these Caro bath towels. And both were quick dry because I hate it when my towels are so thick it takes forever to dry them. And, you know, they're about the same age, but the Target towels are looking really junky. And these Caro mm. towels still look brand mm -hmm. new. And so wow. there must be just something about that brand the colors stay nice. The whites stay nice. They don't shrink in weird places. Like, so if you're at TG Maxx Home Goods, that's where I've seen them. But I'm sure that other stores sell them. I just don't know where. Yeah. All so right. That, that's Thank a brand you. that you can look up. I appreciate your boring recommendation, Marie. That's actually <laughs> yeah. wonderful. It was no hot honey, but you know. I, oh, Julie. <laughs> I'll I, try. It to... took me like five minutes to recover. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the best things about friendships is that we can laugh together. And so yeah. this is awesome to end on a funny note. Thank you guys for talking about friendship today. And listeners, we hope that you enjoyed it. Uh, thanks, guys. Boy, that was deep. but so good. Yes. All right. We'll talk to you next week. Bye, girls. Okay, bye. bye. We're so happy you joined us today. You can find the show notes for this episode at midlifematterspodcast.com. Also, please tell a friend about the show and help them hit the free subscribe button on their favorite podcast app. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at Midlife Matters Podcast. That's where we post pictures and stories about all the things we talk about in each episode. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week.